Hello, and welcome to Spotlight on the Arts. I'm Bill Hirschman, founder of FloridaTheaterOnStage.com, and I'll be your host today. We have ourselves a real Renaissance woman today, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. But first, let's meet our panelists. Carol Cassie is a theatrical marketing specialist promoting the arts of South Florida. Will Schreiner is a comedian, radio, and TV personality, and a director as well. And also a Renaissance woman. I was going to say that. Frank Licanto is a vocalist and musician, and the host of County Line, which can be seen right here on Beacon TV. And our special guest today is April Kirk. And the reason I call her a Renaissance woman is because she is the executive director of the historic Stranahan House Museum. She also volunteers for several organizations here in Fort Lauderdale. She's won awards for her work, and besides all of that, she's an artist who has been selling her works since she was a child. Wow. Welcome, April. Thank, Thank you. you for making time out of all those things to come see us. We appreciate this. Thank you for having me here today. So there are people who are either new to Fort Lauderdale in the area or who go downtown and aren't even aware. Tell people what the Stranahan House actually is, how it came into being. Sure. The Stranahan House is the oldest surviving structure in all of Broward County. So it sits on its original spot in downtown Fort Lauderdale. For those who do know the area, it is actually over the Henry Kinney Tunnel right on the New River off of Las Olas. And it is the, where the city of Fort Lauderdale began, it is the birthplace of our community. So it's a two-story wood frame structure that served as our community center, a trading post, the residence for the Stranahans, a restaurant, and now we're a museum. And inside the museum, what can people see? It's set up back to a 1913-1915 configuration. So it looks as if the family still lives there and they just stepped out for the moment. Wow. And when you come through the museum, you get a full tour of the history of the beginning of the Fort Lauderdale, the Stranahans who were our founding family, and how we came to be today with a connection to the Seminole Tribe of Florida, uh, the growing community, trade, uh, education, everything that they were involved in with the community, they have a strong legacy of philanthropy and giving and civic activism. Do you find people <clears throat> are surprised when they see something there? Very, very surprised. Very surprised about the breadth of the history. So Fort Lauderdale has a short history. Mm -hmm. To put it into context, the house was built in 1901. The city of Fort Lauderdale was incorporated in 1911. And Broward County was incorporated in 1915. So we have a short history. We have some European travelers who come to visit us and say they live in houses older than the Stranahan house. <laughs> so they're surprised to hear that so much has happened in this area. And you have to remember it was Everglades. It was Pioneer Wilderness. Well, let's give people, we have a video that will give people a sense of the Stranahan house, which is known to most everyone here in Fort Lauderdale, but many people haven't been there. So for those of you who are not familiar with it, we have the short video for you to watch. The historic Stranahan House and Museum in downtown Fort Lauderdale is more than just a beautiful place to visit. This historical landmark played an integral part of Fort Lauderdale's formation as a city. Originally a trading post and then a home to some very special people, this house has quite a story to tell. Let's visit Marlene Scotanis at the museum and take a trip back in time to the early 20th century. Welcome to our video tour of the historic Stranahan House Museum. This home was built in 1901. When it was originally built, it served the area as a post office, a trading post, and a meeting place for the people that came to live in this little river settlement. In 1906, it was turned into a home for Frank and Ivy Stranahan, Frank is the father of Fort Lauderdale, and Ivy was the first school teacher that was sent here. Stranahan House stands on its original location at the New River in downtown Fort Lauderdale. Frank Stranahan originally selected the site because it was where he operated his barge ferry across the river as part of the new road from Lantana to what is now North Miami. These barge ferries moved across the water with wooden pulleys and ropes. If you visit the museum and take a walk through the early 1900s, you'll find a myriad of amazing things like marvelous antiques. One showcase piece is this phonograph invented and produced by Thomas Edison. A far cry from the digital audio of our modern world, these wax cylinders had the audio recordings engraved on their outside surface. 
Get a glimpse into Seminole culture by seeing the handmade clothes that they used to wear in addition to other artifacts from this pre-colonial civilization. Frank Stranahan was an ambitious entrepreneur. In trading simple goods like these, he turned a small trading operation into a center of social development. Possessing the only safe in the community, Frank quickly became Fort Lauderdale's first banker in addition to being its first postmaster and businessman. When Frank proposed to Ivy Cromartie, the area school teacher and girl across the street, she laid down three rules he would have to agree to abide by in their new life together. One, he would have to wait until the school year was over to marry her. Two, he would have to shave off his beard and keep his face bare. And three, he would have to stop trading in alcohol and bird feathers. Even though she left teaching at the schoolhouse to marry her love, the teacher and Ivy could never rest. She began to donate her time to teaching Seminole children how to read. In 1906, they converted the main trading post building into the fantastic home that still stands today. The doors are open for all to enter and glimpse Fort Lauderdale's humble beginnings. A guided tour through the historic Stranahan House Museum is a journey into the past. A link to a time when Seminole Indians made friends with a young Ohioan who settled in the frontier town now known as Fort Lauderdale and who built his wife a home so charming it survives today as a unique museum. Restored to its 1913 configuration, the Stranahan House Museum in downtown Fort Lauderdale is a must-see in South Florida. That's amazing, and I think most people <laughs> don't even know just how much depth and how much detail there is available. When, when you're talking to a stranger, what <coughs> do you tell him or her to go, you really need to see this, trust me, there's things here that give you a different sense of the community that you're in. What do you tell them? Well, first, there's no other place like it in all of Broward County. So Stranahan House is unique in which just the structure itself surviving on the original location mm -hmm. is the most fascinating part. It's the biggest piece in our collection. It's the biggest piece of our museum is the actual museum. But even that video, which was fantastic, and I could tell it was produced by Beacon a few years ago, <laughs> things have changed in the museum. Such we've as. updated some materials. We've moved some things around. We've changed some things around in our collection, so we've brought some new things in that we've either been gifted or discovered, actually were belong to the Stranahan's. We've changed some displays seasonally. So there's always a reason to come back. There's always a reason to learn something a little bit new, a different part of the story, expound on a little bit more. And um, it's a great opportunity to get in touch with the roots of the community so you can see how we've grown to where we are today. Are there any ghosts? You'll have to ask some of my staff about that. <laughs> so um, we have some ghost stories associated with the house and we do a really fun Halloween program in relationship with that. People feel that they've had some experiences there. We do believe it's a house surrounded by love and then not a haunting. Um, but we do have fun with it, and wasn't, we do play around with it. Wasn't there like a crazy suicide? Did somebody throw a wheelchair over and hang themselves, drown themselves? Who so, was that? Actually, Frank Stranahan did drown in the river by suicide. So, so uh, tied to a wheelchair, right? No. I mean, a the, um, he, the story is that he had some health issues, uh -huh. and he uh, suffered a little bit from depression. And at that time period, we didn't talk about depression. Right. You didn't have commercials on TV telling you how to help you with depression. There wasn't much on TV in those days. There wasn't days. much on TV in those days. <laughs> yeah. So Ivy really felt that she could care for her husband better than when he was in the hospital, and they came home. And unfortunately, he took a street grate and put it in a wheelbarrow, took it down to the river, tied it around his waist, and jumped in. And right. they were unfortunately unable to save him. Over the years, there's different. So when I was a child, I was actually told that he jumped in the river trying to save some children, and he drowned. Because even at that time period, people were unsure of how to talk about that right, issue. Right, yeah. And now we've learned better that we should be honest about his suicide. It's part of our history and how Ivy was able to survive and continue on past that death. And did she um, live until the end in the house? She, she passed peacefully in her sleep in the house. Her father did as well. Mm. So about five people have passed away on the house, in the house or on the grounds. And so that adds to right. our ghost stories, which, which we tell. Yeah. Well, their I've life heard and yeah. their death yeah, is yeah. part of the history. There are people rumored to have heard people screaming and things <laughs> like that, you know. We, uh, we're not so much screaming since. Um, maybe a little hair touching. Mm -hmm. um, Ivy's brother has That's been Joe known. Biden. That's Joe Biden. <laughs> 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 Ivy's brother's been known to like the ladies, mm -hmm. red hair women especially. 
uh, might feel someone tug a little on their hair in but, the house. But I'm confused because when did Fort, when was the fort on the beach? That was before this trading That was post? before all right. of that. So that was where the yes. Fort Lauderdale came from, named after a, an army general or? Yes, yeah. so William Lauderdale. But um, it wasn't named Fort Lauderdale, it, the city wasn't named Fort Lauderdale until it was incorporated in 19, until 1911. So prior to that, we were actually um, called the New River Settlement. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. I've when seen did some the pictures. Museum, when did the museum itself be created when it stopped being a living situation? Ivy passed away in the early 70s and mm -hmm. she left the house to her church. At that time, the community came together with the Historical Society and the Board of Realtors, purchased the house from her church that's where we would have lost the house. That's where it would have been a condo. They purchased the house from the church, um, incorporated us as Stranahan House, Inc. in 1982, and we opened our doors as a museum in 1984. Okay. It really stands out again, because you have this giant icon, and, and, yes. and then there's this beautiful historic house there. And it's so, it's so sweet that they were able to, to make it, make it yeah. last. I mean, the Bonnet House is another great old piece of Florida history. I think it goes back to the 20s. The 20s and a lot of these places are in at risk, right? Mm -hmm. So the icon being built next to the Stranahan House, it's 42 story building, currently is the tallest building from the Broward County line to Jacksonville. Wow. There's no better story for historic preservation. To have that building so tall next to our oldest structure and we can still survive tells you why historic preservation is important. We can still preserve the history and still grow as a city. Yeah, I remember going to the restaurant when you said it was the Pioneer House. Yes. It had a little restaurant there, and I've been going there since I was a kid. I, I lived right down the river, so I got to see it a lot, and I'm, I'm just, thank you for making it and keeping it as part of our, our, our lifestyle here in Florida so people remember, because like you, like you say down here, we go, we got something really old, 1936, and people from <laughs> up north go, old? I got shirts from 1936. Exactly. Frank's wearing one today. I got older than that. <laughs> So you told us a little bit about uh, his end, but can you tell us more about him and his beginnings? Sure. So Frank came to Fort Lauderdale just looking for a future. Mm -hmm. He really did. So he was a young man from Ohio, and he came down to Florida um, in search of just a business opportunity, a future, and the opportunity arose to operate the ferry across the river. So as the video shared from Lantana, to what was uh, Miami and into the Keys, this was just a stop that people traveled through. So this was Everglades Wilderness, and he operated the ferry across the New River. There was no other way to get across. And then he opened a camp so that people could camp. He started providing amenities. They could stay overnight. He could trade with them. He was trading with the Seminoles and providing um, them money and goods for the handicraft that they created and then sending that up north for um, fashion purposes, beadwork, patchwork, all of those types of things and then it grew mm -hmm. and then he built the first trading post and this actual structure was the third trading post. Oh really? That he built. So were they we, all in the same location? They were all on the same piece of property which he purchased from Mary Brickle. So we all know the name Brickle mm -hmm. from Miami. So that same Brickle, he purchased this land from Mary Brickle and um, opened his third trading post, which the first floor was open and it was all a trading post and the second floor was used as a community center. Oh. So the community came together and met and socialized and had meetings and really discussed the beginnings of the city there. And then eventually um, it served as the post office and the bank and then their residence. Wow. April, I know you get more than 30,000 visitors a year. Uh, do you keep score? Do you know how many are fr from other countries? And is there one particular country that uh, has more visitors to the Stranahan House than others? Secondly, uh, are the children, do the school children, are they brought in to show the early days of Fort Lauderdale and its wonderful history, not only of the home, but of the Stranahans themselves? So we do check, uh, track our visitors. We do ask them how they heard about us and where they came from. We are part of a cultural consortium of downtown entities, and we have discovered in the past few years that we have the highest rate of an international traveler coming to visit us mm -hmm. because they do want to learn about the history of the area, and we are unique in, in what we can provide. I cannot tell you specifically how many um, off the top of my head that is or where they're coming from, but a, a European traveler is very interested in learning about Fort Lauderdale history when they come here, and Stranahan is their first choice. 
to choose that. As far as children are concerned, we fulfill the fourth grade history requirement for Broward County Schools. Oh, yeah. So they're learning Florida history, they're learning about early pioneers. So we see between three to 5,000 students mm -hmm. on site um, coming for school tours. They make butter, they ring our historic bell, they take tours, depending on the age group. Sometimes we get younger students, they'll even do laundry. They go on a field trip and do laundry, but it's exciting <laughs> for them to see sure. that special treat. They do a history scavenger hunt, a trading post, pollution we talk about as well. So we work with students from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. We broadcast into the classroom through Beacon directly from our site as well so we can have a live interaction pro interactive mm. program with the students as well. I'd like to get personal for just a moment. I know that you've won many awards for your fundraising. Now, we all know how difficult a job that is, so congratulations on that. But you're also a very accomplished artist. Uh, I know we'd all like to know when and where did your compassion for art come in? So I'm fortunate, I come from a very creative family. Um, and my parents really supported my art and my creativity um, through my growth. And I had the opportunity um, to focus on art through high school and even into college. I have a degree in painting and printmaking as well as a degree in art history. And it really was in college that I was able to dedicate a lot of time to creating, having some phenomenal mentors and instructors that really helped me hone my craft. That's terrific, thanks So how did you get into this gig? <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to run a museum. Uh -huh. Really? So as an artist, you know, you wonder what can I do as a career? And I thought, well, art, museums. I always wanted to run a museum and I had a very interesting track of how I got here. Um, I worked in a public library to pay for college and I went to school in North Carolina. And uh, after graduating school, I met the man who then later became my husband, and we moved back to his hometown, which was a very small town in North Carolina. And in that town, I just started applying to all the arts organizations. I said, I'll paint sets, I'll do whatever it is you wanna do. I just wanna use my art degree and, and be an artist. And I received a phone call from the North Carolina Shakespeare Festival. And they said, you have a college degree, and you worked in the public library, so you know how to research, we'll teach you how to write grants. And it was the best opportunity wow. of my life. Mm -hmm. So I worked with the North Carolina Shakespeare Festival for about two years, and they taught me everything from running a gala, the membership program, all of those types of things that I never realized was a career, which is we call development, mm -hmm. nonprofit fundraising, and realized that this was something that I actually wanted to do, and it would help me pursue my dream mm -hmm. to run a museum. Right. So I worked in a variety of nonprofits and became a pretty well-established development professional, a nonprofit professional. Keep going, with but my I goal. want to come back to that in a minute. <laughs> but keep going. So, and that when the opportunity for the Stranahan House job arose, my predecessor had been there for 19 years and decided to retire. And even when I called people and said, Stranahan House is hiring a director, I think I want to go for it, they said, oh, Barbie will never leave. You know, she's, she's part of the house. She's been there 19 years. Why would she never leave? And in my mind, too, being young, who worked someplace for 19 years? Eight years later, I'm here, and I can't imagine being anywhere else. That's what I want to ask you about your past eight years, if my homework is correct. You pulled, not you, but everybody connected that led by you, pulled that organization out of a severe debt. Yes. You also have raised a great deal of funds. You've created a large number, not a large, you've created a number of new programs, outreach programs, et cetera, along those lines. How did you do that? Because there are people watching that would love to learn what you know in, in five minutes, what you know that they can learn from. How did, you, how did you pull them out of a deep debt? I think the one thing that we did was we focused on what we knew best, which was our love for the house. When you come to a historic house, it's static. It's the same history over and over. And you could say, I've been to Stranahan House 20 years ago. I've heard that story. Why do I need to go again? And that's when we decided, let's pull these different things. Let's change up our display. Let's tell some different stories. Let's have a little more excitement. And we took a very static, historic house, and we made it really fun again. 
And even in that video, you notice there were some ropes. We don't have those anymore. We took those ropes down. We made it look more accessible. We made it so you feel as if they just stepped out for a moment, that you're part of the house and you really are stepping back in time. And we got creative and we scared some people with some of the things that we wanted to do. You know, the- When you the, put it in that escalator, everybody got yeah. <laughs> The water slide yeah, yeah. down the back. Yeah. <clears throat> that was, but we had fun. It was a 1915. Yeah. It was water slide. It was but wood. We had fun with it though. We really, we, we decided we do a history happy hour where you come and you have wine and cheese and then we share a different story, a topic that we go into a little more depth than you would get on your 50 minute tour. Um, we do a phenomenal event um, called the Holiday Hangover. Everyone has a hangover from the holidays. So we do the first event in January where we bring everyone together, we eat some food, we all get back together, we kick off the new year, and uh, you get over that hangover from the holidays. This weekend, coming up, we're dressing like pirates and we're doing a Peter Pan pirate party with the kids. So we brought a lot of fun activities in it. We made it a place that people wanted to come again, where if you had a toddler, you would not ever think of bringing them to a historic house, but now you would, because it's not such a scary proposition to bring a toddler, because we're having fun and running around dressed like pirates. When we started having fun again, people really wanted to be around us. When the building next door to us was completed, it was okay to, mm, you know, it wasn't right. so scary that we were gonna lose the house, we had the house. So the finances can't all come from admission, correct? No. What, how does the finances of this place work? So we do get a portion <laughs> from tours, tourism, um, Halloween tours, specialty tours, school tours. We also do a number of fundraisers where we bring people in different capacities. We are a venue, so people do weddings and their own special events there. But then we also have grants and that's really where we were able to get innovative and I was able to bring in some of my expertise mm. that we could go um, seek some new grants, find some new opportunities for partnership and funding. We're doing a capital campaign right now to do some site improvements. Mm -hmm. So we have some new announcements coming soon of some new partners and some large gifts that we've received. I want to go back a little bit. Um, several times the Seminoles have been mentioned. Yes. And I would love to know more about what the Stranahans did with the Seminoles because I gather it was inspiring, really. Yes, so the Stranahans had a phenomenal relationship with the Seminoles. They were very trusted within the Seminole tribe. And they helped the Seminoles be recognized as a tribe. So in a time period where our country maybe was not giving our Native American residents the, the respect that was due to them, the Stranahans actually went to Congress and fought on their behalf to be recognized as a tribe, to receive the land that they deserve, and, and to be allowed to, to live in the governmental standing that they want. Um, Ivy Stranahan fought for Seminole children to have schooling, mm -hmm. and there's still Seminoles alive today that remember Ivy buying them their first pair of shoes wow. to go to school. To take it a step further, we still work with the tribe today, and I'm happy to share that I'm the co-founder of a Native American film festival, which my co-founder is the cultural ambassador for the Seminole Tribe of Florida. So we bring a new sort of art form and technology together to talk about music and art um, and film and highlight Native Americans through that respect. So we're not closing yet, but we're getting close. <laughs> but one thing I want to make sure, if people want to know more information about where it is, how, what's inside, is there a, and how to get tours, is there a website they should go out of their way to go to? Yes, our website's really easy. It's stranahanhouse.org. Uh -huh. um, but Facebook is also a great way to connect with us. It has all of our events and programs, links for all our tickets, and we always welcome to people to call us directly on the phone. Wow. What was the relationship between Stranahan and Flagler? Flagler came later with a railroad, right? Flagler came later with a the railroad. There are some stories <clears throat> of Flagler coming through the house and sitting with Frank Stranahan mm -hmm. and talking about the area. Right. Um, we don't have necessarily recordings of those, but we do have some great stories that we think are true. And uh, we actually do have a set of plates in the house that we believe were a wedding gift from Flagler to well, the Stranahan's. Well, yeah. I know that history kind of intermixed somewhere along Yes. The by the way, April, is the Stranahan House available for private events? It is. We yeah. love hosting weddings yeah. oh, good. and holiday parties. Yeah. And it's uh, we're in the middle of some capital improvements. So part of our site is already improved and phenomenal. 
and it's a beautiful place. There's no other place like it that someone could have a wedding. So we love having people come celebrate with us. I've had four weddings there, and it's, oh. <laughs> it's really, it's really a good luck charm. Well, it's yeah. terrific. <laughs> is, is there a piece in there that you are just a, a physical piece in there that you are just inordinately proud of that you want? You know, you wish you could pull people in off the street and say, "You need to see this." I think. It's the actual house itself. Mm -hmm. I believe that the house is the biggest part of our collection. So I think that when people realize it is the original structure sitting on the original land and that you can walk into it and you can touch the walls and you can experience it, that's the most important piece. And people walk by it, but coming into it and experience that, that's the one thing I wish people, everyone could experience the way that we do. Yeah, one of the things that I think was mentioned in the film is that there are new pieces. Where did you find these new pieces that are in the in display now? So Ivy was very generous in her lifetime, and she gave a lot of things away. And uh, so some of those pieces came back to us. Uh -huh. And then there's other members of the Stranahan family, not necessarily their children, um, but distant relatives. So we have a set of silverware that's engraved with all the Stranahan's family's names mm -hmm. that have been donated to us. Were there children? They never had children. And with that happy note, um, <laughs> I really want to thank you. This has been amazingly entertaining and informative and makes me want to get up and go visit the house right now. I want to thank April Kirk for taking time out of her busy schedule to meet with us today. And I'd like to thank our panelists for today, Frank, Carol, and, and the Renaissance man. <laughs> uh, for, uh, <laughs> Spotlight on the arts is a community program, so we ask you to get involved. Drop us an email, let us know what you think. Our email address is spotlightonthearts at browardschools.com. And check out our favorite websites, floridatheateronstage.com and carolcassie.com. You can get all the information you need to keep yourself involved in the arts, including schedules that tell you what's coming for the next weeks and months and years. And make sure you tune in next week for another episode of Spotlight on the Arts. And as the founder of this program, Iris Acker, was always keen on encouraging everyone to get involved in the arts, she would always say simply, go, go to, to the, the theater. theater.